Supersonic flight has not been a challenge for humans since 50 years ago. In 1947, Chuck Yeager was the first pilot to break the sound barrier, flying the incredible Bell X-1. At the moment, it seems something impossible. However, just nine years later, in 1956, it was possible to exceed Mach 3. So the supersonic flight since the mid-1950s is more than achieved. In fact, almost all fighter bombers that operate today are capable of supersonic flight. On the other hand, a very different thing is to design a supersonic passenger plane, which although in the past it has already been done with two models, the Tupolev 144 developed by the Soviets and the Concorde developed by the Europeans, both in the 60s. For various reasons, both ended up being cancelled. One of the main reasons was the sound problems that those aircraft created. Not only the sonic boom when flying supersonic, but also the use of afterburner during takeoff near populated areas. Those problems made the operation of this aircraft almost impossible. However, today we are going to deal with the problem of the sonic boom and see what possible solutions there are to reduce. On the morning of October 14, 1947, Chuck Yeager was flying the Bell X-1 and was about to break the sound barrier, when all instruments showed that he was indeed flying faster than the sound, suddenly below him at the ground level. To understand why this happens, you first have to be aware of what sound is. Our ear is made up of a thin membrane among other parts and those membranes have the ability to vibrate with pressure waves and the vibration will be transmitted to the brain as sound. For example, this vibrating piece of metal will generate these pressure waves in the air. When the vibration is stronger, this pressure wave will also increase in strength. So the greater the disturbance of the ear membrane, the stronger the sound you will perceive. An object flying at subsonic speeds pushes the air forward and out of its way, but since it moves slower than the speed of sound, the air adapts to the shape of the plane, leaving room for it to pass. However, when we speak of an airplane that flies at supersonic speeds, the airplane hits the air without any warning, and now the air does not move away to take the space for the airplane to pass, but the other way around. It is the airplane itself that hits the air and takes it away from its trajectory. This impact will propagate through the air towards the other particles that it has next to it. And that is literally the shockwave propagating. But it is really much more complicated than that, since an airplane does not generate only one shockwave, at least there will be always two. For example, here we have two air particles, the closer they are together, higher will be the pressure, and the farther apart, the lower will be the pressure. Initially, the particles are at rest, the first shockwave compresses them, since this is the impact of the plane against the air. But along the surface of the plane, the pressure decreases, and at the rear part of the plane, there is another shockwave that compress the particles to the initial pressure. This form of N in the pressure is what is always talked about in documents regarding sonic booms, since if there were a person just below, they would feel a sudden increase in pressure, and then follow it by another. So they will hear a double boom. But if you look at it, the pressure drop in the middle of the N is not perceived, since it is progressive, and this is the key point to reduce the sonic booms, making the increments in pressure at a very progressive way. Please, do not misunderstand me, this is the simplest case. The usual thing is that objects will create more than two shockwaves, but these two will always be there. The aft and rear parts will always generate a shockwave. For example, the Falcon 9 rocket of SpaceX generate three sonic booms, but most likely in the middle of the body, more shockwaves are generated, but not strong enough to perceive them. Personally, something that I had a hard time understanding is the fact that an airplane breaking the sound barrier sounds exactly the same as an explosion. How can this be possible? The truth is that what happens in both cases is the same, and once explained how our hearing works, it is easy to understand. <laughs> 
an explosion, suddenly a certain volume of air expands very quickly as a result of the chemical process of the explosion. This rapid movement causes a shockwave to be generated, which propagates through the air. That is, the sound that humans associate with an explosion is simply a shockwave. And that is why an airplane that generates a shockwave will sound the same. And also any object that generates a shockwave will sound the same. A whip, for example, although of course, depending on the intensity of the shockwave, it will sound more or less stronger. It can range from a small noise to breaking the people's eardrums or breaking windows. Or if the energy released is much greater, it could have effects similar to those of the Beirut explosion of the year 2020. It is known that on several occasions, aircraft with supersonic capacity have been used in war to make low passages at approximately Mach 1.4 and trying to damage or create panic on the enemy troops, only with the power of the noise. There are many war stories about these low-pass occasions. But even more incredible is the Soviet project M25, a supersonic plane designed to use its sonic boom as a deadly weapon. There is very little information about it since the project ended up being cancelled. Also, these few documents are in Russian. But for example, in this article here, it says that the initial tests were carried out with MiG-21, which with its shockwave managed to break glass. But it was determined that in order to use the sonic boom as a weapon, an aircraft with a worse aerodynamic shape was needed. Worse meaning that it could create a stronger shockwave. So by creating this monstrous shape, the shockwave generated will be five times more powerful than that of the MiG-21. And with that amount of power, they could even knock down buildings. To increase the intensity of the shockwave, it occurred to them to create a special flying formation with several aircraft, which depending on the speed at which they were flying, the aircraft were closer together or farther apart in such a way that the shockwaves of the aircraft were in phase and added intensity from all of them together. But the project was cancelled years later, and this supersonic killing machine never saw the light. So, because of the noise pollution of the sonic boom, the Concorde was banned from flying supersonic overland. Many European countries and the United States made this decision as a result of the effect on the population created by the noise of the sonic boom. Actually, in the United States, for example, the Concorde was not banned, but it was the supersonic flight itself. This is where in 2003, NASA got very seriously into study how to reduce the sonic boom. And the first idea they developed was to optimize the geometry by modifying a Northrop F5, known as the sonic boom demonstrator super Pressure. The objective was to generate the compression of the air by means of several shockwaves, in such a way that this sudden pressure jump is transformed into several smaller jumps, causing our ears to perceive it as smaller explosions. When we look at the results obtained, we can see a clear reduction in the pressure jump. So it seemed that this idea worked, and that is why later they continued to develop this idea with a quiet spike program. A modification of an F-15 with an extendable nose created by different cylinders that grow in diameter as it approaches the aircraft body. The idea was the same here, generate a series of shockwaves before the plane generated the strong shockwave, so that the final compression will be more progressive and not suddenly. The results definitely showed that through this way the sonic boom could be reduced. And that was when NASA signed a contract with Lockheed Martin to design a whole plane from scratch, with the only objective of reducing the sonic boom. Right now, this plane is at the design process, but it is estimated that in 2022 it will fly for the first time, and supersonic flybys will be scheduled in cities to see the effects on the population. Until now, we have talked about reducing the sonic boom only through geometry, but there are more ideas that surprisingly seem to work as well. It is interesting to discover other ways, since through modified geometry it would be necessary to spend a lot of design in the manufacturing of conical parts that are very expensive to produce, and also a lot of space inside the aircraft will be wasted since it is impossible to allocate cargo, passengers or any other payload in a so small, a slender nose fuselage. The first different idea is that the nose of the plane is capable of vibrating, a 
expanding and contracting. I am not talking about adapting to the flight conditions, since this would be like the idea of the modified F-15 that need to adapt this length to the flight speed. But in this case, we are talking about expanding and contracting at least 20 times per second for this to work correctly and create many shockwaves. The shock wave depends on the angle of the nose, but this angle is continually changing. Thousands of shock waves will be generated. This will create, from the perspective of a person who was standing on the ground, a compression of air in a progressive way, because as we have mentioned earlier, the shock wave will not be sudden difference in pressure, as if we were talking of a normal supersonic plane. But now, this shockwave will be the sum of many small ones. This could be understood when thinking that a small change in the angle of the shockwave of an airplane that flies at an altitude of 10 km will be reflected in a lot of distance on the ground. The effect that this will have on perception on the ground is that the pressure graph will become very long and will no longer be abrupt and sudden. Remember, the greater and sudden the pressure jump, the stronger the shockwave perceived. The second and completely different idea has to do with the injection of electrons into the air. The idea is the following. Putting a thin rod in the nose of an aircraft, this rod at the tip will release electrons that will later on be collected in the fuselage of the plane to leave the air with a clearly neutral charge. The objective of releasing the electrons is that just in the shock wave there is a high density of air particles that have absorbed those electrons in such a way that there will be many negatively charged particles, thus appearing a repulsion force, causing the shock wave to go from being a thin line of molecules molecules to a thicker strip because of these repulsion forces that would force them to separate, making the shockwave no longer an abrupt change but rather it would be more progressive, which would cause the spectrum detected on the ground to transform from the typical N to something more like that. Of course, this idea is still to be developed, an estimate has not been made of how much energy it would take to put it into practice, nor how much it would cost. But two things are clear. The first is that the sonic boom cannot be eliminated, but if reduced, perhaps to such an extent that it is not even perceived by humans. And the second is that the most plausible ideas in the short term, in the next 10-15 years, will be oriented to geometry and perhaps oscillations. Other ideas of ionization of air, use of plasma or similar things, although on paper they work, they are still very far from our technology. But I'm sure that many of you are asking what is Boom Supersonic doing to reduce the sonic boom? And although it sounds illogical, they are not doing anything. They are going to generate sonic booms and they are not going to worry about it, at least in the first aircraft. They have said that this will not be a problem for them since they will focus their flights on transoceanic routes. 